Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to part three of this hands-on with Maxon intro to rigging. I'm Ellie and I'm a trainer at Maxon and I'm joined by New York animator, Joe Herman. How's it going, Joe? Pretty well, pretty well. Nice to see you again. Thanks so much Good for everyone for coming and uh, for your comments and your views and your participation. Really yeah, appreciate. we've had some really lovely comments, haven't we, over the last couple of weeks. It's been an, inc it's been an incredible kind of two sessions already and then we've already got a few people in the chat who are giving us a hello so we've got Bern, Charles, Jay, Wesley, Hannah, Neil all saying yeah. sort of a hey to both me and to you Joe so it's nice. That we've What's that? Them. What was the last thing you said? They're sort of saying hey to us both we have sort oh, of like okay. some people who I think have been regulars on this right. workshop. One thing that I'm that's really so great it. is is uh, that it's so many people from around the world you know it's it's wonderful to see such an international yeah. and group you know. Yeah, we do. We have people from from all over. So we've got Charles is in Toronto. We've got Jay's in Newcastle. We've got Neil. We've got some some UK people today, which is yeah, quite nice. Cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's great. Love the cool. UK. Yeah. So let us let us know where you're from and give us a hey in the questions area inside yeah, the YouTube and we'll be, be sure fun. to say hey back. Yeah. So here's a quick overview of uh, the workshop. So it's been broken down into six different parts. And so far we have done part one and two. So we've done intro to rigging and we've done point weighting. And you can actually catch up with those sessions on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. So I'll show you where that is in a sec. And then part three, so today we're looking at constraints and C motion, and then you can see here what's happening next week and also in parts five and six, and as well as the dates that they're gonna be taking place as well. So really quickly, some extra bits. All these sessions are recorded and they do get uploaded onto the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. So if you ever, if you're ever late, if you ever miss one, you can just check them out on the. We've got a hands-on with Maxon playlist on there, as well as all the other sessions that the guys do as a training team. You can just head over to there and you can catch up on all of that great stuff. And we also have some project files. So Joe's been working really hard behind the scenes to put together a whole bunch of project files for each and every week. And the idea is we upload these ready for these sessions. So you can actually download them and you can follow along if you want to with the project files with what Joe is gonna be going through today. All this info and all the links that you could possibly need for the things that we just talked about is actually in the handout section in GoToWebinar. So if you have a little look in the control panel, there should be a little drop down for a handout and there should be a PDF in there. If not, not a problem. Let me know in the questions and I can just link you to project files, uh, the previous recordings, any of the stuff that you could need. Um, that's not an issue at all. And then don't forget, you can follow Joe on Twitter and Instagram at Joe Herman Artist. Thank you. So part three, constraints and C-motion. Joe, do you want to talk a little through what we're going to be doing today? Very good. Yes, I'll start. By the way, I, I can actually, I haven't really been reading the uh, chat so far, but now today I, somebody told me how I can actually read the chat. So I see your wonderful comments and thank you so much for, for them. Um, I won't read them now, but so, okay. So in part one and two, we, um, we, we spoke about different things, mechanical rigging, point weighting. Um, today we're going we're gonna to inch ever closer to uh, rigging a full character, which a fully articulated character with fingers and, you know, and, and heads and all kinds of, you know, um, controls, which we're going to do in the next session, but we're going to get closer to that. We're going to build upon some of the skills that we've already learned. And we're going, so one thing, we're going to start by, by using constraints to do a common thing, which is have a character or a rigged character, pick something up, lift it up, put it down somewhere else and have it go somewhere else. That's that's a skill that that can be done with constraints. We're going to rig a bird, um, and we're going with. And after we rig the bird, we're going to use C motion. Now C motion is a really powerful system within Cinema 4D. That, as far as I've seen, I think that it's unique to Cinema 4D. I don't really see it in other um, packages to quite the same extent as it is. It's usually um, uh, how shall I say, um, associated with walk cycles and run cycles and this type of thing. However, um, C-Motion is extremely uh, useful. Oops, sorry about that. It's, it's extremely useful for uh, any sort of cyclical motion. 
So bird of uh, flapping bird is a cyclical motion. That's not a walk cycle. Uh, you know, pistons and an engine is a cyclical motion. Uh, so the thing is, is that um, it can, it, it, it really is your friend. A lot of people are actually a little uh, put off by it because they think it's difficult, but it's really not difficult. What's difficult is trying to animate without it. So once we're going to try to like pierce the, the veil of its, you know, um, uh, so-called, you know, learning curve, which is not really that deep. And then once we'll understand it, you can use it for so many things. It's your friend. It's not your enemy. Um, then we're going to talk about rigging legs and feet um, because that's important uh, to know how to do. And we're going to actually use C motion to create a simple walk cycle for that quote unquote character. And as you can see, there are the project files. Oh, actually, that's right. We're going to start with uh, something that uh, actually it's the third thing on the list. It's it's this muscle bulge. Uh, so which is actually we're going to start off based on a question somebody asked in the last um, uh, class. So that's what we're going to go do today. Cool. That sounds great. So before we get into it, before I fire it over, I'll just quickly show everyone where the project files are. So in the handout, so this is what the handout should look like. And we've got all the different links that you could possibly need, upcoming events, session recordings for this workshop and the project files, which can be found here. And they're all separated into their individual weeks as well. And so these are the ones we're going to be working on, um, these four here. And this is the one that Joe, you're talking about right now, isn't it? Someone asked that that yeah. question about how if you like kind of bent the arm, you'd get that muscle. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Cool. That sounds great. And then really quickly, you know, here's the Maxon Training Team channel. If you did want to catch up on any of these sessions, just literally search Maxon Training Team and then come down to Hands On With Maxon and you can see we have part one and part two on there. And then we'll have this part three uploaded later today. Right. So, Joe, shall I chuck the screen over to you? Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, let me actually go ahead and share my screen. Cool. Um, let me just, I can pass it over. And it's really nice. All the guys have been saying, guys and girls have been saying in the chat about where they're from. So we've got, um, we've got Anders yeah. saying, hey, from Sweden, Jim from Chicago, Christian from Germany, Jason from Denver. There's so many of you from, from all over. You've got Brooklyn, London, Yorkshire, um, and they're all really excited for well, workshop. hello to everybody from England. Hello from people from Chicago. I think I saw that you were, had some pizza there. That's very good. I wish I had a slice. Uh, Brooklyn in the house, you know, I'm from New York City. So um, my hometown, although I'm not from Brooklyn, I'm from Manhattan. Um, and uh, France, I see, South Carolina. Very good. Very good. I, I, I like that. We're going to, we're, oh, and there's Kent. Hey, Kent, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, so thanks for tuning in. So anyway, let us actually get started. So as can you see my screen, by the way, Ellie? Yes, we can see it. Okay. All good. You can see it. You can see it. Okay, good. So very good. California. Cool. All right. So um, what we're going to do is uh, last week, actually, I wanted to start this off because last week somebody brought up at the end, they brought in uh, the th question was, is that, how would you, for example, if you're going to bend some bones? Um, oh, did you? Maybe I should uh, tur turn off my camera. Is my camera being shown? Yeah, yeah. I think then it just makes the screen kind of nice and big yeah. for everyone, which is okay. uh, which is great. But if you want to turn it back on when you're doing like questions or later on, okay. Maybe on, I'll leave it on right now free. because I wanted to show you something. So, like for example, if you bend a um, uh, a thing, you know, we want to maybe make the the muscle bulge in the uh, in the bicep. So the thing is, is that um, that is actually something that that we wanted to show here. So, so um, let's see now. Um, okay, here. People are gonna, okay, so anyway, I'll do it full screen. All right. So here we have the um, we have something here, and what we want to do is we want to actually, this is actually going to be a very good introduction to the pose morph tag, okay? And the pose morph tag 
is something that is extremely useful in rigging and in animation. Uh, and it's very, very useful for all kinds of things, including facial animation. Uh, and in some, in other uh, software that you may or may not be familiar, uh, there's something called blend shapes, and it's a similar thing to blend shapes, uh, but, um, but it works different in Cinema 4D, and in some ways it works better in Cinema 4D in a lot of ways. And what it allows you to do is that if we go to the cylinder right now, Okay, so right now we've got this cylinder. We rigged it in a previous um, class. So the thing is, is, if I choose this joint right here, you can see that it's rigged now, so it, it bends. Doesn't it really look like it's weighted correctly, though. Well, that's odd. Well, let's actually, I'll, let's actually make sure it's corrected. Do we have the fan bone going? Let me go to a front view. Oh, the fan bone's not working. Okay, so, well, that's odd. Okay, let's actually just quickly um, get that little fan bone working just uh, quickly. So if we go to the rigging tags under constraint and we give it a parent constraint and we add two constraints and we take off the position, I'm not gonna explain this too much because we've explained it before, and we drag in this joint and uh, this, and, uh, this joint, oops, sorry. Drag in this joint and this joint. Actually, before we had named this as lower and upper, but um, maybe we'll just name them right now just so we can not be confused. Okay, so there's lower, upper, and then there's fan, and we've just given it two parents, the lower and the upper. So that way, what happens is that when we rotate the upper the uh, this joint is blended its rotation is blended between these two joints because it has two parents they're both at 100 percent so the system is smart enough to understand that this joint will take both of these rotations and blend it to the uh to that joint so now this joint is looking a little bit better I'm not sure how i must have taken it off at some point but anyway so what we want to do is when we when we bend these two joints like this, um, hey, Jay, let's go. That's cool. So anyway, so the thing is, that when we bend these two joints like this, we want to have a bulge happening here. So what I'm going to do is on the cylinder right here, I'm going to right click it and I'm going to go to the rigging tags and I'm going to bring up the pose morph tag. OK, and there it is. It's pose morph tag and it's on the object that we want to create a pose morph to, for. So if we click on the tag, okay, there's different things. If I, I'm gonna open up a new project for a second. I'm just gonna create a cube, let's say, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click the cube. I'll give this a, a pose morph tag, okay? And you can see I can, for example, if I go, if I choose a position ta uh, for, for position, and if I go into the tag now, as soon as I choose position, it brings me into this tag mode. It has what's called a base pose and pose zero. We're in the middle of use, we're, we're in the middle of editing pose zero, which is the new pose. The base pose is its original thing, it's, a, it's original state. Pose zero is the pose we're working on right now. So like, for example, I could double click that pose and I can call it moves, move left. Okay, so that's the move left pose. If I drag this cube now and move it left, okay, I'm in the middle of editing. You can see that the edit radio button is checked. I'm in the edit, middle of editing this pose, and I get like a little slider here that's just showing me that is the pose that we just created, okay? Uh, once I'm done, and then if, I, for example, if I wanna make a new pose, I click add pose, okay? Now that makes a third pose. We've got a base pose, Move left, and the, my, the, the new pose, I'm going to call it move right, okay? I mean, I'm sorry, move back, okay? And on this pose, I'm going to move it back, which actually is not really back because the back really should be Z, but I'm not, I don't care. But anyway, so then that's back, okay? And here is left. So this is the left pose, back pose, and then base pose. Now, as soon as I switch into the animate mode, 
you'll see that I have sliders for all the poses and they're, they're both set to 100. So what the nice thing is, is that I can now move these poses to exactly where I want them and I can mix them. Okay, I can mix these poses. So that's really well and fine. Okay, let me get rid of this pose tag. Okay, let me actually bring this back to zero. And uh, let me actually get the X axis, which should really should be left and right. What people really use the pose morph tag for is to, to pose the points on the model. Okay, that's where its real usefulness is. So for example, if I go back and I give this again a pose morph tag, okay, there's this one, there's rotation, there's scale, there's some other things as well, but what the one that's really useful is its points. Right now, we can't really create any uh, point pose morphs because this is a parametric object. So we're gonna have to hit the C key uh, in order to create an editable mesh, okay? And go to the points mode, okay? So now we're in the points mode. So now let's go back to the pose morph. Remember, we're in this edit mode and we've got pose zero. So what we're gonna do is, first of all, let's create a little loop. So we're gonna take the, the, um, the knife tool or KL will give us a, a loop tool. Okay, we'll create a loop around this polygon, around this thing, we'll make it 50%, so it's right in the middle. Okay, so we've created a little bit more geometry there, we've got some points in the middle now. So we're in this pose morph, and we're gonna call this pose, we're gonna call it sides down. Okay, and in this pose, we're gonna take the sides and we'll just move them down a little bit like that, okay? So that's our pose, okay? So um, so basically, if I go to the, um, oh, okay, I did it wrong actually. I didn't, I wasn't in the pose morph tag when I did that. So I have to be here in edit now I moved them down. I wasn't in the pose morph. And now you can see, well, why is that not working? Okay, so now here's what you would call an opportunity to learn why this is not happening. Let's try this again. We're gonna right click on this. We're gonna go uh, rigging tags, pose morph. Okay, and we're going to create a points morph. There's our pose, okay. We're going to select the points we want to create the pose for. Okay. And there we have, there we have it. Okay. So that's going to be our first pose. Okay. And uh, let's name that pose. Let's name it sides down. Okay. And now we're going to create a new pose. Okay. And we're going to call this one um, maybe sides in and on this pose we'll just for example take the scale tool and we'll scale in these po these points like that okay so now we're going to go back to the so there's that pose and this pose so if we go back into animate mode now we've got sliders for each of those okay and we can go ahead and we can mix them. So later on, when we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about facial animation later at the towards the end, because facial rigging is a whole, you know, course within itself. There's a lot going on in the face, uh, which you can do in several different techniques. One of them is by using this pose morph tag to create different poses for, um, you know, phenomes which are different lip shapes, as well as blinks and stuff like that. There's another, but we're gonna talk about different philosophies when it comes to that, but one, but this is very important. So that's the basics of what a pose morph is. It's a list of poses that you created, which then you can mix together to, to dip, put different poses on your object, okay? So let's go back to this muscle bulge thing, okay? We're gonna go onto the cylinder, 
We already created actually a pose morph tag before, but in case you missed it, I'll start over. I'll go to the rigging tags, I'll choose pose morph, there it is, and we're gonna create a point morph, okay? And then we're gonna name it muscle bulge. Okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to go ahead now that we've done that. Remember, I have subdivision surfaces on. And we're going to go into our points mode. Okay. We're in the edit mode of this pose morph. And we're going to, like, for example, click um, this point, let's say. Okay. And we're going to drag that up a little bit, like to here. Okay. We're going to maybe select this point and this point here. Actually, I'll select this one first. This one second. We'll bring that up a little bit to here maybe bring this back down i'm doing this with subdivision surfaces on we'll select these two points we'll scale them out a little bit okay maybe like that and then we'll take this one and or we'll take actually we'll go on this side first and this one and we'll move those up maybe scale those out a little bit like this Okay, so now we've got like a nice big fat juicy muscle, which is certainly not what my muscles look like, but maybe that's a good thing. So, so we've got that going on here. Okay, so now if we go to the pose morph tag, you can see that we've got a bulge in our um, uh, thing. So now if I go into ed animate mode, on the pose morph, you know, I can set a keyframe for it whenever I want, and I can slide this up and down. Now, so what I can do, obviously, is I can take the upper joint, and uh, remember, you have to be in model mode in order to move the joints. I can sort of move this up. You know, I can, for example, take this. There are keyframes here, okay? I don't want keyframes here. So I'm going to go on my timeline, okay? I'll pop it out. I'll get rid of keyframes. Okay, so I can, for example, go ahead and um, let me hide the other timeline. Is I can set a little keyframe here. I can go ahead to about whatever 20 frames later and move this up to about let's say I'm keeping my eye. Look, it's about 126. Okay, and I can keyframe that. Right, and then I can go ahead and then I can take my pose morph, okay, and I can set a keyframe for the muscle bulge at zero here, go to 20 and up it to um, the, uh, the full on. And I see somebody in the chat has asked, okay, so you can see like that. So then anyway, what happened is that you have this nice bulge going on there. But it's a two-step process. You have to rotate the bone and rotate the, uh, the and then up the muscle. Now somebody uh, <laughs> uh, uh, has um, has said, well, that's cool, but can somebody can you just control the amount of the bulge by the rotation of the joint? And the answer is that's exactly what we're going to do. So. What we're going to do is let's actually get rid of those keyframes. And um, so we're going to get rid of all the keyframes. So how do we do that? How do we control the uh, amount of the pose morph with the rotation of the bone? And it's a very important thing. We could do it manually by setting up Expresso manually. We could set up this Expresso manually. We could make an Expresso tag. We could drag things in and do it manually. Or we could use, we could take a little shortcut to make the Expresso. Okay. Last time when we did that claw, we made the Expresso manually. If we wanted to um, do it, have a little shortcut, this is how we would do it. We would take this bone, the upper bone. Now, which parameter needs to be animated? As you can see, it's the P, okay, the pitch or what, the rotation pitch. So we can take this and we could right click on the P and we can go under expressions and we can say, set this as a driver, okay? So this is gonna drive something. 
immediately after you do that, what you're going to do is you have to decide what it's going to drive. So we're going to click on the pose morph tag, and here's the muscle bulge. And what we're going to say is we're going to go to expressions and we're going to say set this as driven. Okay. Now, two things happened when that happened. First of all, an espresso tag was automatically created. So I could have done it manual, but I'm just taking a shortcut. The other thing is, is that if I click on the upper uh, joint here, you'll see that the keyframe for the pitch rotation is doesn't look like the other ones. Okay, it looks like whatever, you know, something different. So that's telling us that this is driving something. Okay, and if you go back to the pose morph, here, this is actually a different, this is like the rectangle, the triangles on the left side, whereas the triangle on this one is on the right side. So that means that's a driver, okay? And this is being driven by something, okay? So that's really cool. So now if I were to take the upper joint and if I were to, to sort of start moving it, you see that it's driving that bulge a little bit, but there's only one problem. It doesn't really drive it all the way. Why? Okay, so the reason why it's not driving all the way is that if I open up the express the espresso like this, we'll see that first of all, several nodes were automatically created, and that's what I mean that this is like you could all do all of this manually. you could you could um, drag the upper joint in and then you could put a range mapper in and put the pose morph in and do it all, but it just does it quickly and automatically for you. But if we look at the so, if we look at the range mapper, we can see that the input range is, is in degrees, okay? And the input lower is at zero and the input upper is at 360, okay? So, which means that, for example, if I were to choose the upper bone, right now it's at zero, okay? And if I'm, if I want the full bulge, I'll have to go all the way around Keep going until I hit 360 before I get the full bulge. Okay. So, but really the thing is that I just, I want the fullness of the bulge to hit at around, let's say, 125. That's where I want the fullness of the bulge to come in. So, no problem. I'm going to go to the range mapper and rather for the input upper, rather than go to 360, I'm going to type in 125, like that. So now what's happening is that as I go to 125, like that, it goes to the full bulge, okay? And with this, so now, for example, you know, whatever you want to do, if you, let's say, for example, you set a keyframe for that, you go like, you know, 20 frames later, you keyframe it a little bit like that, you know, you, you go back down to to zero, like, you know, like back down here or something, you know, and you don't, you never have to worry about keyframing the bulge because it's being driven by the bone. Okay. So, you know, you could do whatever you want to do there like that. So in this way, you could drive a pose morph with uh, a bone uh, and you don't have to set keyframes by hand. So, is there any question on that? Not at the moment, not I can see. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, if but a couple any... of questions relating to something slightly different. Go ahead, shoot. Um, so this could be so Jim was saying this is more a question for later, but I thought I'd drop it in now. Can I bring a in a human model with hair from something like Poser or Daz into C4D to be rigged? Do you know? Um you can. And there's I think in Daz there's something called a, a bridge. Daz there's a bridge thing you can bring in. You can't just open it up. Uh, you know, it has, but you can, you can, you can bring it in and you can rig it. I think you have to use some, uh, some, some sort of a bridge software. My friend, a friend of mine once used Daz and he did that and we brought it in Cinema 4D and saw it in all of its glory and stuff. As far as the hair is concerned, 
Uh, I'm not a big DAZ user. I know that I think it's using polygon hair. Uh, it's not using true hair like Cinema 40's hair system, which be, which is very powerful, by the way, which would be a great thing to do maybe so a, a webinar on is is um, is is uh, Cinema 40's hair system here. Uh, it's not the same. So probably I think that it just uses like poly. Yeah, it uses poly hair. So um, so the thing is, is that. Uh, you know, it, it'll probably come in with that. I don't know about dynamics for that. Like I said, I'm not a DAZ user, but I know that there's a bridge to bring it into like Maya or Cinema 4D or other software yeah. as well. So, um, so that's it. So now, by the way, so I did mention this last week, and this is something also that would probably be better for a separate class because it's kind of complex. There is a muscle system in Cinema 4D, okay? Uh, and it, there's a lot to it, okay? You could put dynamics on the muscles. So if you move, you know, the joints, the the muscles kind of like flop around a little bit. You can tell, you know, uh, the, the, the muscles to behave like real muscles. The thing is, is that it's kind of like overkill for a lot of things. Uh, if you're doing like a science experiment, experiment you know, uh, or scientific video, and you really want to mimic the, the the human musculature system, because it's actually kind of like you put in muscles where they're supposed to be, like tricep muscles and bicep muscles, and there's all kinds of controls that lets you de determine how the muscles sort of undulate under the skin. Does it pull the skin with it? Does it? Does it? You know? Does it? Um, does it move under the skin? It's complex to do. Like I said, if you're if you're like making like a video on, you know, on 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 how a dinosaur, you know, for the Discovery Channel and how a dinosaur bones would really work, you know, and and people give the most realistic view of that, then by all means, it's a it's it's great for that, you know. But it's not, it's not like a one two three thing. If you're just basically creating, you know, superheroes and slightly cartoony or very cartoony or even not cartoony even realistic things you'll probably get a long way with just using pose morphs and uh you know and and, and being able to um uh animate them that way so i did want to mention the muscle system that's something maybe we can look at in an advanced context um so there so uh, so so but but it's not it's kind of inappropriate to look at it right now so i guess if there's nothing else we can move on now last yeah. week we actually rigged this claw uh and we kind of made this thing so that way we can go ahead and we can you know move it we have a fan bone here i rotated the fan bone 90 degrees so it's 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 just it's doing the same thing okay it's it's uh it's still you know working on that on that joint there and uh we also said if you remember we said for example on the uh on the claw itself that we put a user data slider in there oops here under user data for that claw the user data tab not here but here and so that way it could kind of like pinch pinch itself and uh so the thing is is that what we want to do though is we want is like like what would what I'd like to do is I'd like to have it pick this thing up. This is a very common thing that you're doing when you're rigging, you know, you're moving whether it's a gun or a flower or whatever. Somebody picks a flower from the ground or whatever. You want to be able to like have something come and pick something up and maybe put it on something else, and then this thing maybe will move. So what what we're going to do is we're gonna we're going to move this thing over so it picks this up, lifts it in the air, puts it down on this, and this thing is going to leave with this thing on it, okay? So how would we do something like that? So the way that that we're going to be doing that is, um, is we are going to be uh, using constraints because constraints are so useful when it comes. We've already used a, quite a few constraints. We used a constraint to create fan bones as well as um, other things. And we'll be using more of them as we go along. But this is a, a fairly typical thing that you would use constraints for. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is, first of all, on this thing right here, 
uh, just just out of just I thought I'd remind you that what I've done is that is that it's at zero 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 and you might ask yourself well how is that zero when it's up in the air zero isn't zero at the center of the world and the reason is that zero zero is because I froze the transformations if I unfreeze it you can see that it has rotation and position information and in as soon as I freeze all it makes it at zero which means that if I mess it up or rotate it or bring it somewhere where it shouldn't be you know or not not where it shouldn't be but just in a different place if i go ahead and if i go ahead under the the uh either either i can zero it out here or i can go to the tools menu and just choose reset transform and we'll go back to its frozen position so that's like i said a very useful tool but what i want to do is i want to keyframe it in that first position okay and I want to go whatever, let's say I'll go like, you know, 30 frames later, okay? And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on auto keyframing. Now, auto keyframing would be probably better spoken about in a um, in a uh, animation class, but we might as well speak it here because rigging and animation are kind of the same thing. So we're going to say auto keyframe. What auto keyframing does is it lets you, wherever I move it, if I move it to here, let's say, okay, it's automatically going to set a key there, okay? And if I change it like that, you know, whatever, it's going to update that keyframe, okay? If I go somewhere else, you know, and I move it down to here or something like that, it creates a keyframe there. So it's automatically creating keyframes as I go. And when you're animating, sometimes you don't want auto keyframing. But a lot of times you do because it just makes the process a lot easier. You don't have to, you sometimes you forget to make keyframes and stuff like that. So basically you want to have auto keyframing on a lot of the time, unless when you don't want it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this thing, we're going to, you know, move it down a little bit. By the way, um, I also want to uh, go back to the first frame and I want to auto keyframe this. I want to set it, the first keyframe, a lot of the times you have to do manually. And then from then on, it's auto keyframing. It's like After Effects like that, okay? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to um, uh, frame 30, okay? And we're going to turn this thing uh, around. We're going to rotate it down a little bit, you know, like that maybe. And we're going to uh, rotate it uh, kind of on this. Uh, action option and sort of bring it over here and rotate this whatever because i want this to come over and i want to place this thing nicely sort of like right oops where am i okay i'm not in the right place okay so I'm gonna put that there i'm gonna move this down a little bit okay i'm getting there okay so maybe somewhere around there uh maybe for example i want to take the the um the, the pole, which we spoke about, the IK pole, which we spoke about in previous classes, in case you're wondering what that is, it's the IK pole. So this way, it helps with the rotation of the arm and the positioning of the arm, okay? So it's gonna kind of come over there. Maybe we'll bring it a little bit closer to that thing, okay? Somewhere like that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use that user data control that we use. So now here you see by the way i was a little sloppy okay and that's what you have to worry about auto keyframing because i went to frame 32 and i moved it by instead of frame 30 okay so that's a little bit of a problem so i'm just going to take this keyframe and i'm going to move it back there and i'm going to check to see that one's fine so okay there we go so now it goes right there so about two frames before it hits the end of its move so it would be frame 28, okay? I'm gonna to go to the claw, I'm gonna to go to the user data, okay? And I'm gonna set a keyframe. Remember, this is uh, a um, driven by Espresso, or this is a driver for Espresso. So we're gonna keyframe that, creates a keyframe. I'll go, for example, it's gonna settle into its move. I'll go a bunch of frames later, and I'll drag this up so it's kind of like, there it's not quite in the right position so i'm going to go back to frame 30 where this thing's up i'm going to try to center this a little bit more like that okay and uh then i'm going to go back to the claw the 
clench and we're going to see it's going to close just a little bit more and who you don't need to be perfect okay because after all this is just a demo but i know that the tendency is to want to make things perfect okay so what we're going to do is we're going to move this down a little bit and then you can see that okay so now it kind of comes in and it grabs that thing okay so now what i want to do is is first of all i want to hold that hold it there while it grabs it to so we'll hold it to about frame 35 which is where the clench ends if you want you can bring up your timeline it help it'll help you see the keyframes a little bit better so the clench ends at 35 right here okay and uh so what i want to do is i want to take this uh you know claw and i want to keyframe that again so it's going to hold it it's going to hold it while it moves and after it finishes clenching okay then i want to move it up the only problem is okay let me hide the uh timeline the only problem is, is if i move it up now okay it's on this thing so maybe it'll just pick it up okay but if i move this up now it doesn't pick it up it just leaves it back so the question is is that how do we get it so it picks it up okay so and the way that we're going to do that is let's go back to the first frame okay what we're going to do is on this we could do it on the torus right that's fine because there's a torus and there's a base and there's a sh shaft and these the base and the shaft are all children of the torus so wherever the torus goes those two move but what we're going to do is we're going to right click this and we're going to give it a rigging tag we're going to give it a constraint tag okay and, and for the constraint, we're actually going to give it one of the most useful constraints, which is this parent constraint, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to we're actually going to give it three constraints. So for this to work, we're going to have to make it have three constraints. So let's just give it three constraints right off, uh, three parents right off the bat. One, two, three, okay? And for the first parent, what we're going to do is we're going to drag in this thing right here which is the plane okay so we're going to go ahead and we're going to go into the uh constraints and we're going to drag in the plane okay as soon as we do that now this thing is constrained to the plane okay it's a it's a child of the plane so if i were to rotate the plane whatever i do this thing is on the plane now okay but we also want to go ahead and we want to give it another constraint too okay not just the plane we want to give it a constraint to the wrist goal which is this thing okay so we're going to go ahead to the constraint we're going to give it a constraint to the wrist goal so what does that mean when you give things when you give one things to constraint i mean when you give one object to parents well what happens is that Notice happens is that if I click on the plane and I try to move that, it's actually not quite moving with the plane anymore, okay? And if I move this joint over here, it's kind of moving with that joint too because they're both influencing the, uh, the torus now, okay? And for the last thing, what I want to do is I want to click on this constraint here and I want to drag in the platform okay so now th even this too is influencing it all three of them are influencing this torus okay so what i want to do is obviously in the beginning i don't want them uh, the only one that i wanted to be influenced is the plane okay because if i were to start we already put some animation but you can see that that doesn't really work right so what I'm going to do is there's two things that I can do, okay? I could make the influence of all the other things zero except for the plane, right? And then if I choose this, it's only influenced by the plane, okay? And then once it hits the plane, once it hits this, I can set the influences 
to the wrist goal and drag this down and drag this up, let's say. Oops. Okay. Now, it did, did something weird. So, for a reason. Okay. So, okay. So, but there's an easier way to do it. Okay. And the easier way to do it, rather than me messing around with these settings here and setting keyframes, the reason why it was doing weird stuff is because I didn't send any keyframes, is I can go ahead and I can, where it says update local offsets, I can just say set plane. So that sets this at 100. There's only one problem is that it didn't make keyframes for it. So watch what I do. Hold down the control key, click on this thing and hit set plane and it sets a bunch of keyframes for you and makes this at 100 and these two at zero. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to the posit point where this clench finishes, which is at frame 35. I'm gonna hold down the control key Go to this pop-up menu, and I'm going to say set wrist goal. Now, the um, the plane went to zero, and the platform went to zero, and the wrist goal went to 100. So what's happening now is that it goes down, and now what I can do is I can start animating this, and now this thing is on it's set to the wrist goal. It's now a parent. Its parent is now the wrist goal. So I'm going to animate this up a little bit. I'll move this over to, um, you know, to here. Let's say I'll move this thing back to. Oh, here's something important: is um, you got to make sure that you know what you want to do. Oops, hold on is okay actually what i did is i kind of messed things up so let's actually go ahead and into the dope sheet okay because what i did is under the constraint stuff okay this came down to here okay and i shouldn't have started moving that wrist goal until here Wait a second. The wrist goal, this, okay? So really the thing is, is that I started moving the wrist goal before the clench. See, it didn't clench down yet. So let me undo that. That'll be the easiest thing to do rather than move around the keyframes, okay? Let me, okay. So, see, I have to wait until it clenches. Then we go to the thing, and now we hold down the control key and we set it to the wrist goal. I was setting it too early, okay? So now after it clenches, that's when we want to set it, set the uh, thing. So now that we did that, okay, we'll set a keyframe for the wrist goal here because that's gonna be the start position. And uh, also, this thing, you want to set a keyframe for it there, okay? So that way, because this stays there for a while, and that's what the problem was. You have to make sure it stays there long enough for the clench to, to finish, okay? And now we'll go another, let's say, to frame 60. Now, if we raise this up, okay, now it's raising it correctly, and we'll move it over to here. Okay, we'll take the, uh, this is global rotation. What this basically does is that, is that right now the axis of this wrist goal is aligned with the wrist goal. It, it, uh, it, um, it aligns with the wrist goal here. But if I go over here, then the axis aligns with the world. I switch it back and forth between this thing a lot, okay, depending on what I'm doing. Right now, I want it to be aligned with the object. So we're gonna move this around, okay? We're gonna rotate this a little bit like this, okay? We're going to bring this up, for example, like this, okay? And uh, move this like that. And we're gonna move this thing, okay, back sort of in this position here because 
that's sort of where it is. And maybe what I'll do is I will move this up a little bit. Okay, so it lifts it up in the air slightly. Okay, so what's happening here is that we have this, go ahead, pick that up and move it up. Okay. Now, maybe we'll move it just a little bit like that. Like that, that's fine. Now, I mean, there's some, um, things that we can do to, to, you know, we can keep messing around with the keyframes. We can also, for example, uh, change the position and rotation keyframes so that they don't happen at the same time. Because a lot of times, for example, if you wanted to have a rotation happen earlier than a, than a uh, position move, you, can, you have access to all of that stuff here. Here's the um, rotation, position, and scale keyframes here. So if you want to have them happening at different times, okay, for example, we might want to have this rotation happen earlier than its final move. So, you know, if you go do something like that, it's happening faster, the rotation, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. But I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I'm not going to be crazy about that. So, so now we have that, okay, so then that goes to there. And now what we want to do is we want to, uh, let's say over here, we were to take this handle back and we were to move this back to here. You know, we'll set a keyframe for it there. And then as this thing comes up, it sort of waits for it to come, let's say at frame 80, we'll have it come right here. And, um, And so then basically what happens is that as it's doing that, this thing comes ready for this thing to be put down on it, okay? So it'll come there and then we'll, we will want to go ahead and we want to set a keyframe on this because we want it to wait there, okay? So it's waiting there and then we'll go ahead, that's 81, let's be nice and neat and set it at 80. And we'll go ahead, let's say to 20 frames later or whatever, and we'll take this thing and we will um, put it, take it down. We'll put it sort of like this. We'll move it over to here, okay? And we'll just sort of straighten it out. Okay, we'll move that down like this. Okay, maybe make it straight. Take this keyframe, move it up. Okay, move it forward a little bit to here. Okay, and uh, rotate it a little bit. Like that, we just wanna get the base to be sort of reasonably square with this. And that's fine, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go nuts on it, but um, we'll do something like that. And then once we're here, we wanna go back and we wanna go back to this thing and hold down the control key again okay and uh we're going to go ahead left click it and i mean control click it and say set platform okay and then we'll, we'll go like for example another whatever 30 frames later whatever it's going to be and uh we're going to move the handle thing we're going to move it back out to here let's say because now it's a child of that and uh there we have it and then what when that does it maybe 10 or 15 keyframes key over we want to move this back you know to kind of be here and uh take this rotation thing and move it up okay and then while we do that we can unclench it okay so the thing is is that oops hold on Okay, so I messed it up again. So let's see. So the thing is, is that this is gonna, okay. I didn't put a hold key, I didn't put a hold keyframe on the handle. So the handle comes up and it shouldn't start moving until right here, which is frame 100, let's say. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take this keyframe, we're just going to click it, we're just going to copy it over. So then now it, it needed to wait. I just had it move right away. That's why it snapped to it. And so there we go. Now, as this thing moves back, we want it to open up its clenching and we want it to happen fast. So we go ahead to the claw. We're going to keyframe the clench. We're going to go, let's say, two, three, four frames. We're just going to open it up. Okay, you could animate it however you want, but so then what happens is that you can see that it opens up and it goes back to its original position. And so it's this process, the purpose of this lesson was to learn about this set, this update local offsets. And if you hold down the control key, you can actually automatically set keyframes and then whether you want your character to like pick up a flower or pick up a uh, something to drink or, you know, I mean, you can work on the timing later or pick up a, a weapon or a um, rather to pick up flowers than weapons, I guess. Oops, oh, I messed that up. Sorry, I wanted to move this back. So there's that. Does it uh, or pizzas? um but uh anything you wanted to have so is there any question on that yes we do actually have a couple of questions that have come in let me go back up so there was one earlier from sorry if i'm getting the name wrong it said i think jiro is there a reason we wouldn't want to use dynamics for this or is this the preferred way of doing it well you wouldn't really need to use dynamics for this because i mean you could use dynamics for this. You could make, well, it depends. You know, I'm not really sure. It would be too, it would be kind of challenging to make it that perfectly because the thing is dynamics. If you press too much on it, things won't explode. You know, it's quite, yeah, dynamics good. can be quite unpredictable. In, in certain ways. Now, if it was, if it was a bowl of cereal, okay, and you had a spoon, and you wanted to scoop some stuff and then pour it onto that surface, yes, I would use dynamics for that. Or pour something, let's say I had like a, this would be a great demo, actually. Let's say you had a bowl of like peanuts here, right? And you had a bowl of peanuts on the, uh, on, on the platform, right? And you wanted to have this have a spoon with a concave surface, you can have this go in there, pick up the peanuts and then go over here and then turn them around and they'd fall inside the other bowl, which would, you know, the, the, the peanuts themselves would have rigid body tags on them, but the bowls would have collider body tags on them. And so would the spoon, right? And you could do that would look great. And you couldn't do it with the parent constraints. You know, that's how you would want to do it. But for an object like this, um, you know, you could, you what you could do is you could do a mixture of of uh, of dynamics. For example, if you wanted this this torus to fall onto the platform and kind of like you know bounce around when it fall like a dynamic thing would do, what you could do is you could make it a child of a null, let's say, and only to and then have you would start it off with parent constraints till it got to let's say this position. Then what you would do is you would invoke the dynamics, you would have the dynamics off, you know, until right here, turn the dynamics on and have this thing fall onto the platform. You follow me? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you would, for example, at this point right here, you know, if you were to, to give it a, a rigid body tag, you know, and then where it says, and you keyframe the dynamics off until right here. And then, you know, you would put a collider body on this, on, 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 the, uh, on the platform, right? And then all three of these things actually 
I probably want to make this one thing because if these things are stuck into each other, the you know, let's take let's take a let's take these things off of it actually for the time being, right? And the thing is, is that if I were to then, you know, put um, if I were to just do that, and then you know what what I would do is uh oh. Uh, the dynamics work. Hold on. Actually, what I would have to do is I'd have to keyframe this. Uh, I keyframe the dynamics off here, right? So it's going to take this, going to pick it up, and then this would move there, right? Let's actually kill these two okay and then on this one right here um uh, i would basically on the torus i would keyframe it off and then go to the next keyframe and then keyframe it on right and then what will happen is that is that it should fall at that point. So this thing would go on. Okay. Well, it does, but you'd have to, you know, you'd have to do this can't be moving, whatever. But then what'll happen is that it will fall onto this thing and probably roll around. Let, let me stop moving this thing, take the keyframes out of out of the uh, handle so it doesn't move after that. Oops. So then, you know, you would start it. Well, well, okay. Say, well, anyway, the, the, the aiming is off. But so you could use dynamic depending on what you were trying to do. Okay. But if it was a flower or a cup of coffee or whatever, I wouldn't use dynamics. If you wanted some dynamic interactions happening in the beginning and at the end, yes, you would use dynamics. Here, there's no reason to use dynamics. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I guess it, like you said, it depends on the type of animation that you're kind of looking yeah. for. If you wanted to coffee. pick up a pile of coffee beans, yes. Yeah. <laughs> there was another couple of questions, if, it, if that's okay. Go ahead. So, Jean was wondering this is when you were going back to keyframing. Should yeah. the constraint keyframes be in constant mode? That's a good question. Automatically, when you, when you, um, when you actually use this technique of, uh, actually, let me undo this because I've got dynamics here. Where was it? Where? Okay, there. I think we're back to where we were. When you use this, uh, this, this technique of this control clicking with these update local offsets, okay? If you go into the um, timeline, right? And we were to look at these, this timeline here, okay? Here's the keyframes for the constraints, okay? So if you look at the keyframes for these constraints, okay, like for example, these, let's say, or really, uh, yeah, so like, for example, these, right? So if you look at them and you look at their, at their graphs, okay, you'll see that actually, they are indeed constant keyframes. Okay, so it holds its mo it holds its value until right there. Okay, if they weren't constant keyframes, like or or, or step keyframes, whatever you want to call them, okay, and they were linear keyframes like this. Oops, hold on. Like that. They were linear keyframes, then the motion would be interpolated, and then then you wouldn't really get what you want. Although, in this case, it does seem to be working, but um, who knows why? I don't really want to dig into it right now. But they are they are constant keyframes. It's smart enough; it automatically knows to make them step keyframes, which basically means that, um, which basically means that that it, it holds the value until the keyframe and then it blinks the new value in 
as opposed to interpolates the value over time gradually. So yes, you do want to use constant keyframes, but you don't have to worry about it because it automatically, um, you know, it automatically uh, puts the constant keyframes in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Okay. Yep, we got a yep. Thank you in the chat for that. Thank you. Very good. Very good. We've got Very, one more quick you. one, mm -hmm. but this this may be um, something that you, if you have the time to show later on, or if you have the time to explain it now. Jeff was wondering, could you briefly describe how you'd set up a double constraint tag to an object, like a shovel handle attached to both hands of a character? What would be parented to what? Mm. Yeah. You know what? Re just remind me that when we're going to do a full character constraint. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because about being a full character rig. Because yes. Yeah. So I, 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 there's, it's kind of a little bit of a loaded question because it could mean a double constraint is that one thing can have two constraints on it or two things, or like you can have one, like a shovel with both hands constrained on it. Right. So so we can maybe get into some of it we'd have to tease that out a little bit cool exactly. yeah no we can always save it for yeah for later on in the in the workshop and one one final one just from um, andrew if, if you don't mind can okay. you auto target the ring so its absolute center points down as it belongs to its parent it inherits translation but auto corrects its center yeah yeah you can um yeah, you can do that. As a matter of fact, you could probably use what's called a, uh, you know, you could probably use on 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 the torus. You can use under the constraint on the under the rigging tags, under the constraint. You can use what's called an up constraint. Okay, and the up constraint, what it does is it will tell this object oh, that always point up. Okay, always point up to the y. So, like, if I were using up constraint here, I can tell it what's the up vector, okay? And you actually can use a target for the up vector. So, so um, you know what? I, I, I actually want to, but but that's how you would do it. Maybe we could do a demo of that later. But yes, you would, you could, you could set it so that way, no matter where you move this thing, it's always going to be pointing, pointing up. So you don't have to actually worry about, you could have this thing kind of dangling off the edge. So no matter where you were to rotate this thing, however you were, this thing would always have an up vector pointing up. Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. Yeah, got uh, thanks. Yeah. So we could do that later. Let's put that on the list of things to show later. Yeah, all right, cool. You know, cause I, I actually, like just like the muscle bulge we did, you know, like it was, um, like maybe we can set aside some time to talk about that, but let's put that on the list. Yeah, cool. That sounds um, great. Cheers, Joe. Yeah. So let's go ahead to this thing. Okay. So here we have a little bird. Actually, I I actually um, updated a little bit this morning. Okay, because I gave a little bend to the beak here, and I put these eyes in there, which are really nothing but little spheres. Okay. And this is like our first character, I guess, that we were, we're going to rig. But we're not only going to rig it, but we're going to actually use um, uh, we're going to actually use that C motion system that I talked about to create the flapping. So, okay, thanks everybody. I sort of have my eye on this chat, by the way. So um, what we can do is uh, is so let's actually go ahead. Let's quickly rig it using some of the uh, skills that we learned last time. Okay. I will go to like kind of like a side view. Okay. Here's our bird. By the way, this bird does have subdivision surfaces on it. That's the actual polygons. These are the smooth polygons. Um, we actually have this weird sort of crimping thing happening here, and um, which you can fix easily if you go to the Fong tag. Okay and you change the angle, you up the angle of this thing. The Fong tag, as you may know, is that it smooths out the shading between the polygons, okay? So um, if you have zero angle, then you see it's kind of faceted, okay? And the thing is, is that if you have it 
the more you go up, the more it's smooth. So if you have a little problem like that, just up the fong aid a little bit, and then it will get rid of, of, of these types of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to kind of like a side view, okay? And we're going to start building our rig. So we're going to bring out our character menu. We're going to choose our joint tool, okay? And we're going to go ahead and... Um, um, uh, but th that was a good point about the up vector, Andrew. Thank you for asking that question. So we're going to left click to create our first joint right here. Okay. And uh, where is it? So I, I, it's like, where did we create it? It's not even there anymore it's because I had something selected. So I made it a child of that. So we don't want that. So actually, let's make sure nothing is selected. Okay, we're going to left click okay and it creates a joint actually it's creating two joints right so what's that all about it's created two joints and the reason is because i have joint symmetry on and i don't want joint symmetry because the may, maybe i'll turn it on later for the wings but for the body i don't want joint symmetry on so i'm just going to take it i'm going to say no symmetry on the on the joints and i'm going to left click and there we have one joint okay and we're going to go you know kind of in a straight line we're going to create our second joint there Okay, we're going to create our third joint there. Okay, and we're going to create our last joint there. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to let's we're going to go back to the to this joint. Okay, which is this one in the center. And we're going to go the other way, and that's also really important is the position of joints. A lot of times in a character, the you you, you where the pelvis like the legs point down, right? But the spine points up. So usually it's the pelvis, which is like where, where you have like the change in direction of the joints, because this way you can bend your back and bend your legs separately from bending your back. So this is kind of the same idea, same concept here is that you we're having like, like the bones change direction in the center. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to left click right here. That's going to create a new chain okay you say the hierarchy is different now okay we're going to go back and then we're going to go all the way to the end and we're going to create those joints like that and we're going to call these joints something we're going to call the one in the middle we're going to call it uh i don't know body okay and then the one over here we're going to actually matter of fact let me start doing um these joints in the front we're going to call this one neck okay and we're going to call this one head okay and then we're going to call this one in the front head tip okay and then the ones in the back we're going to call this one rear or rear end if you want we're going to call this one tail and then we're going to call this one tail tip. Okay. Um, put a little dash in there. And I'll put a little dash in there for the heck of it. You can name them any way you want. So now these are named. Okay. And now it's time to make the wings. Okay. So we'll go to the front view. And uh, let's actually go ahead and with the joint tool as it is. And we're going to left click, with control click with the left mouse button right here. Actually, it's making it a child of my head tip. Okay. So obviously that is not what we want. Okay. That is not what we want. So we want to make sure that nothing is selected. Or you could have the body selected because ultimately we're going to make it a child of the body. We're going to left click, control click there. We're going to control click between these two joints. We're going to control click, left control click between these two joints and at the tip. Now, I wanted to bring something up to you. And that is if you use the joint tool to move a joint, you notice that this Y axis always stays perpendicular to the Z axis, which is aligned uh, to the joint. Okay. How, if I were to move this joint, though, with the move tool like this tool in object mode and I move it, 
you notice that it doesn't align this perpendicular perpendicularly okay so this is actually a good tool to use to align joints because it keeps that aligned however um it doesn't really actually change the alignment of this joint because you can see that the z-axis of this joint is not on the z-axis of the bone okay but you can fix that easily by just going to the root and just clicking align okay and now you notice that it fixed that problem and all the joints are aligned if i were to go ahead and you know do some crazy stuff with these joints like that whatever i could just click on this first joint and just click align and it aligns all the joints okay so the thing is is that you know i don't have to worry i'm just going to do it and then take the first one and in case align sometimes it doesn't matter you don't have to align your joints but sometimes it does so i don't have to worry because these joints are aligned now so now what i'm going to do is take my first joint here okay and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my mirror tool and I'm going to clone it, okay? Direction, I'm gonna go positive to negative. Why is it positive? Because it's positive along the x-axis. Remember, along the x-axis, starts at zero, goes up here and negative this way, okay? So we're gonna go positive side to negative side, okay? And we're gonna go ahead to the tool thing, we're gonna mirror those joints, okay? So now we've got those going on and what i want to do is i want to click on all of these joints shift click them go to the basic tag and name them all wing okay so now they all have the name wing okay and then with these on the, the with these which were on the left side of the character we're going to go to the naming tool okay and we're going to name them we're going to add a uh we're going to name them left Okay, so actually we're gonna put a prefix of L underscore, which is there already, and a suffix of dash dollar sign number. You don't have to put the dash in if you don't want, but what that's gonna do is it's going to sequentially number them, okay? So now we're gonna replace name, and then it names them L dash, I mean L underscore wing zero through L underscore wing three. I'm gonna do the same with the other side, go to the naming tool, Okay, and then what we're going to do is this time we're going to make it R and put the suffix of the number. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, replace name and that names them right. Okay, now we want to put them in the right place in the hierarchy. Okay, and the right place in the hierarchy, let's say we're going to go back to the perspective view. I'll hide the, the uh, geometry for a second. We're just going to take these two things these and drag them under the body so you'll see it connects automatically to the body and now they're in the right thing i move the body around okay and everything moves okay uh you know if i if i but you know you can go ahead and go to the wing and then you can rotate the wing by itself and whatever okay so now that we've made the hierarchy of joints Okay, now it's time to weight this. Okay, so hopefully we remember some of the ways to weight things. Now, first of all, like I said in previous lessons, you have to first start by binding the mesh to the joints. And you can do it automatically by just selecting all the joints and the geometry and just choosing. But I'm not, notice I'm not selecting the eyes, and I'll show you why later. And I can just click the bind, and it will bind it with auto weights. Okay, but I'm probably gonna throw away most of those auto weights anyway. So I always bind it manually, which is simply by left clicking this, adding a weight tag, okay? Uh, then, then making a skin object over here, dragging that underneath of the cylinder. And then in the weight tag, what I can do is take all of these joints into the weight tag and then drag them in, okay? And now we're ready to weight. Okay, so what I'm going to do now here, I'm, I'm going to show you a little shortcut that in last classes, I told you to get the weights manager out. You can take the weights manager from here, but if you shift double click 
the weight expression tag, it will go into weight painting mode. Let me turn off subdivision surfaces, right? And we're going to go ahead and drag this to the left. Okay, and now we're ready to start our weighting like before. And notice that all the joints are selected here in the weights manager, and there are no colors, which means that there's no weights going on yet in this object. And so I'm going to switch to the, um, see you later, Christian. So the thing is, is that I'm gonna switch to the uh, points mode, and uh, now we can start waiting, okay? So the first one that I'm gonna wait, okay, now the thing is, is that I'm going to choose the weight tool to wait. Remember, I can wait points with just by selecting them and waiting it, but we're going to use the wait tool. And what we're going to do is we're going, since this is a symmetrical object, we're going to enable symmetry and we're going to give it a naming convention. The left bones on the left are going to be started with an L underscore and the bones on the right or the joints on the right are going to be started with an R underscore. Okay. So the thing is, is that, but you might be asking yourself, but wait a minute, the neck bone and the head bone and the head tip, they don't have left and right joints, okay? They, they, there's only a single joint, okay? And so but this weight tool is smart enough that if it's a single joint, watch what happens. If you do one side of it, oops, I have to select the what I'm waiting to. So we want to wait to the neck let's say. If I do on the, on the one side, it automatically does the other side on the same bone or on the same joint. Okay, so I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's actually symmetrically weighting that one joint. However, if I were to do it on one of these wings, it uses, if I click here, right, now this is weighted to the L wing zero. This one is weighted to the R wing zero. So if it has one of these names on it, then it doesn't do it to the same joint. It does it to the joint on the opposite side. It's kind of like smart like that. Okay. So um, not, so hopefully that makes sense to you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the body and the neck, both of these. As a matter of fact, these joints here, okay, these two joints, this, I'm sorry, this point and this point right here, those two points, I want it to be affected by three bones. I want it to be affected by the body. I want it to be affected by the neck. And I want it to be affected by the wing. I wanted all of those joints to affect these two bones and only these two bones. And on the, okay, so not, the, not this bone down here, but only these two bones because they're going to be moving when the bird is flapping. So what we're going to do is we're going to select, we're going to go back to the weight tool, okay? We're going to make, first let's make sure nothing is selected. Then we're going to go to the weight tool. We're going to select these two bones. We're going to select these three bones, body, L wing zero, and neck. One, two, three. I mean, one, two, three. And we're going to, we're going to weight these at, uh, at oops, this has to be at 100%. We've got to make sure you put this at 100% in the file that that if you're going to follow along right now, uh, or if you download the files to follow along, somehow or another, I set that to zero and saved it like that. That's not good. So at 100%, we're going to click it here and here, and notice that it got weighted 33 and a third percent to those three joints because it's intelligent. It knows you chose three joints. I'm going to give a third to each joint. Okay. Now on these points on the bottom, and, and it also did it symmetrically. Okay. This is R wing zero. This is L wing zero. Okay. Now we're going to go down to the bottom of this thing. We're going to select instead, we're just going to select the body and the neck because that's the only two joints that I, the two joints that I want to affect these ones here. I don't want the wing to affect these. So I'm going to select those three like that. Okay. Same thing with the one, the one on the top. Okay. Just the body and the neck. Okay. So those are done. Okay. 
Now what I want to do is I want to select the neck and the head, okay? And I want to go around and weight those joints. I mean, those, those points on those two. So it's 50% on each of those. And then I want to select just the head because I want to weight, I want to weight these points all to the head. Okay. So now those are weighted all to the head. And as you can see that those are weighted now hundred percent to the head. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and we're going to do the ones in the back. Well, actually, let's do these, okay? These, oops, these points on the bottom, I want to weight to the body, 100% to the body, okay? And it's some, some symmetry is on, so I really, if I just click one, this one is going to be weighted, but not the one in the middle. That one you have to do by hand, okay? This one here, I want to go to the body and left wing one. 50% to each, okay? Like that. These two, I want to weigh to three bones. I want to weigh to the body, R wing zero, and uh, the rear, okay? And I want to weight those three. And as you can see, what happens is that they get weighted 33% to each. You can go into the weights and check the weights here, by the way, if you want. OK, uh, but you can also hover over and you could also check for normalization problems here. I don't have any normalization problems because they're all gray and not red. But um, so now with the, these two, these three on the bottom, we just want to wait to the rear and the body. OK, and same with the one on the top. OK. And then on this one here, okay, on these two, we want to go ahead to the rear and the tail. We want to weight these, okay? And then the ones on the end, we just want to weight to the tail, okay? And then the only ones that we have left to weight, so you can see, by the way, if I click on the weight tag, you can see, oops, I forgot. I forgot this one right here. So that one I, on the top, I just want to wait to the body. Okay. And then I didn't wait these either. I, I forgot about these. So this, these I want to wait to the body and left wing zero. Okay. And then it's, I don't, I'm not worried about the other side because I know it's happening symmetrically. Okay. So now I want to go to left wing zero and left wing one, select those two. And I want to wait these. Okay, which is going to distribute them 50% between those two joints. And then I'm going to go to left wing one and left wing two. And then I'm going to weight those 50%. And then I'm going to go to left wing two and I'm going to weight these 100% to there. Okay. And now you can see that the entire bird is weighted. So, um, Okay, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put back my subdivision surface on, okay, and I'll, and I'll hide the weight manager. So are there any questions about weighting this thing? So we've had a couple of questions in from Jean, and it was, so originally, so when you were naming it was saying the L underscore and R underscore naming is is obviously quite important then in this process, yeah. right? The, the, in the weight tool, the symmetry won't work if you don't put that L and R. It just won't work. So you're gonna you'll what you'll end up doing is weighting half the model, but not the other half. See, like because now this model is weighted, you know, um, for example, I can go to like for example the neck, you know, and go to object mode and you know, this thing is nicely weighted, you know, but, oh, actually, I forgot to do something. What happened to was eyes, right? So the thing is, is that I can do one of two things. I can actually weight the points to, um, to these eyes, okay? Or I could do a parent constraint, 
I, or I could do what we did in the first class where I can just put it as a um, children of the head. Okay, so now if I if I take the neck, let's say, and I rotate this, or even if I rotate the head, you know, I'll have them looking around, like it could be looking at us, right? Or it could be looking this way or down or whatever, but they're just children of that head. Or I could like leave them out of the hierarchy if I want, okay? And then I can go ahead and I can say for the constraint tag, I can give them constraint tags. Um, uh, Okay, and I can just give them both parent constraints. And I look, I have them both selected and I can drag the uh, the head in there. And it's the same as now they, they'll work exactly, oops, they'll work exactly the same as if they were in the hierarchy because they have parent constraints. See that? So, but yes, the R underscore and the L underscore are important. Otherwise, you can see, you will, ha you'll, will have waited, you know, um, half your model oops look i have a waiting problem here there's a waiting problem here okay and that is is that i'm rotating this this part shouldn't be moving here so let's examine what this problem is okay so we're going to go to subdivision take that off okay let's go to the shift click this okay where was this problem 30 percent to the r wing oh okay that's what it okay and it, I, I i reversed it i i actually i should I, I i should be selecting body l wing zero and rear and then i should be taking the weight tool and i should be weighting these points okay and now it's to the l wing and not the r wing i selected r instead of l before Okay, so now the thing is, is that now it's fixed. And basically uh, the thing is, is that if you don't have that, you see now it doesn't have that mistake anymore. So yes, that is important. Anything else? Couple of other ones. So earlier when you were talking about this, you mentioned a normalization problem. And right. the question is, could you perhaps explain what that problem um, could be referring to? So we, the thing is I, what I would refer you to is I would refer you to the second class where I go into normalization, what it is. But briefly what it is, is that every point has to be weighted 100% to a joint, okay? It can't be weighted less than 100 and it can't be weighted more than 100. All of these numbers for the total weight of every point to has to be 100. So if it's so in this case it's weighted 33 and a third percent to three joints. Okay? So the ultimate weight is 100. Okay? Here this one point point 17 is weighted 100% to uh some uh to a to a thing so it's it's weight is 100. If I were to try to go ahead and if I were to weight a joint, let me actually take off auto normalize. And if I were to weight a joint 150, or let's say I made this number 40, okay? Now we have a weight that's more than 100%. So now we have a weight that is, um, is, uh, is illegal, okay? So it's not normalized anymore. So, but to get more of a discussion of it, watch part two and you'll understand all right so now what i'm going to do is now that this thing is weighted okay i can go ahead and i can i can uh animate it okay so i can move this joint a little bit up like this you know move move the next one a little keyframe it move the next one a little bit up if i wanted to you know and move Move the neck a little bit down, you know, move the tail, the rear of the tail. I can also, for example, like on, on the bottom joint here, I can maybe like roll it a little bit, you know, to get the, uh, to get it flapping kind of cool, you know, so like when it goes up, it's down this way. And then when it's this way, when the, when it goes down that way, kind of like if it's propelling itself forward. So um, what I can do, you're welcome there. And what I could do is 
but that's a lot of work, man. I mean, obviously you have to do that sometimes, especially if it's, you know, non-cyclical motion, you know, it's character just emoting. That's what you have to do. But this is actually a different kind of motion. This is a cyclical motion. It's a flapping motion. So what we want to do is we want to start learning into this thing called C motion. Okay. So what I'm going to do it has a lot of uses, like I said, especially for walk cycles. That's where it really kind of is known for, but it's also great for other things. So what we're going to do, okay, is we're going to go ahead to the character menu. We're going to create a C motion object. Now, as soon as you create that, it comes in turned off. Why it comes in turned off? I have no idea. I mean, if you selected it, it probably means you want it turned on, right? But the nice thing is that you can turn it off if you want. But the thing is that it's turned off. So what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn it on. And then what we're going to do is in the attribute manager, we're going to click this object tab. So what is this thing and how does it work? So like I said, it's for meant to get it's for it's meant for you to easily animate cyclical motion. So what we're going to do is we are going the way that it works is that there are these things called hubs and targets. Now, I don't want to get into too much of a description of what a hub and a target is, but just think that like the hub is the parent and the target is the children. So like for example, if I were to rotate my pelvis Okay, then my whole body rotates, right? But if I were to rotate my wrist, then um, the whole body doesn't rotate with my wrist, right? So in this case, like my pelvis is a hub and my wrist is a target, okay? Because if I rotate my pelvis, my wrist is going to rotate with it. Think of it like that in a simple term. So what is the whole, the thing is that I'm going to drag in, I'm going to make kind of my hub. I'm going to make like the thing that's kind of like the root of everything, which is this one joint, which is right in the middle, right here. It's this one joint. That's going to be my, um, my hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this joint and I'm going to drag it in. And now it's inside of C motion. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to set up this flapping on the wings. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the L, the, let's, let's do it with the R wing, the right wing. So I'm going to take the R wing zero and I'm going to drag it in as kind of like a target of the hub. Okay, now as, as, as soon as I did that, something weird happened. Okay, and what happened that's really weird is if I were to hit play, something weird is happening. That's not the motion that I want. I don't want to have this like back and forth motion. It's taking this joint, it's moving it forward and backward. The reason that it's doing that, and I actually don't think it, I think it, they, they shouldn't do this, but I can understand why they did this, is because they're assuming you're trying to set up a walk cycle, okay? And it's assuming that's a foot, okay? So it's not a foot, and it would be better, I think, that if we went into this thing, Okay. As it's the default set, way that it comes in is it comes in as a step. Okay. So I don't want steps. So I'm going to set that to none. I think things should come in as none. And when you're setting up steps, you set them to steps, but they come in as steps. Okay. So now it's not doing anything. Okay. So now we got rid of that weird thing that was happening. Now, what I want to have this is I want to have this flap. Okay. So in order for it to flap, okay, let me actually hide the geometry so we just see the bones, the rig. So in order for it to flap, you can see that, that on the axis of this joint, here's the x-axis of this joint. So I want to rotate around the x-axis, up and down. So I want to give this thing an action where it rotates up and down on the x-axis. So to do that, I'm going to select this target, which we brought in, which is the right, and I'm going to give it what's called a pitch rotation. How do, what, 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 what is a pitch rotation? Why don't they just call it rotate X axis? They kind of do, okay, because it says RX. That's how you know which one to use, because there's P 
pitch is there's twist, which is rotates around the Y axis, and then there's roll, which rotates around the Z axis. Okay, so we're going to choose the pick pitch, which rotates it around the X axis. Okay, now when I do that, okay, nothing happens yet because I have to add, you have to press this add button. Okay, now I've added this action to this R10. See that? Now, if I press it and I hit play, nothing happens still because I have to give it more information. Okay. So the thing is, is that what I'm going to do is there's something called the phase. Okay. And the phase is kind of a hard thing to at first to understand, but then once you understand, you're like, oh, no problem. The phase is like when you're doing a thing like a walk cycle, you have like your feet, right? They're doing the same action, okay? They're lifting, they're putting down in front of them, they're moving to the back, they're lifting again back to the front, okay? But they're doing it out of phase, okay? One is doing it one, and then the other one is doing it like 50% later, okay? That's what the phase is, the same with swinging your arms. When you walk, you don't swing both of your arms in the same direction back and forth, the two arms. One goes first while the other one goes back, and then the other one goes forward and the other one goes back. So they're out of phase, okay? So what we're going to do is that this is, so this is telling us that let's make it easy because we could leave it right now at the phases at 25%, but I'll make the phase 0% because it makes it easier to look at this graph, okay? So right now, that means at the beginning of its flap, uh, it's, it's gonna start its action. So what we're going to do is we're gonna go, right now this thing is set to be 30 frames for one flap cycle. See, that's what this time is. So we're gonna go all over here to about 15 frames, okay? And we're gonna flap it we're going to control click it here to make a little thing. We're going to bring this up. We're going to bring this one and this one down. Oops, okay, I have to bring them out separately. So what's going to happen is that, see, if I drag this thing through this thing, it's going to go down. Zero is, by the way, no motion. So I'm going to go down. It's going to go flap up and flap down. And you might be wondering, well, why is it not flapping? I'm scrolling through it. How come it's not flapping? because I didn't tell it how much to flap yet, okay? And that you do with this 30 degrees. So I'm gonna pipe in 30 here, okay? And now watch what happens. It's down, halfway through it flaps all the way up, and when it gets to the end of its cycle, it goes all the way back down again, okay? So if I were to press the play like this, you see that this thing is flapping, okay? So that is our first action. Okay, it's on the R wing zero. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna bring in R wing one now, underneath of, uh, right on top of it as another target. Now, as soon as it comes in, it screws everything up again. Why? Because it's set to that stupid steps thing, which is not stupid. It's very useful when you're doing walk cycles. So you wanna hit none, okay? So now on this one, we also wanna give it a pitch, okay? We want to give it that same pitch and we want to add it. Okay. So now, once again, what we want to do, we'll give it another, like, let's say we'll give it, we'll do, we're going to exaggerate it. We're going to give it another 30. And we're going to do that exact same thing as we did. We're going to control click to make a new point in the middle. Okay. At five, at, at, um, at, you know, 15 frames. Okay. If you want, we can go, we can do it exact. If you want, we go to, frame 15 and do it because it's set to 30, okay? And now what we have is both of them are doing, are, are, are bending 30. That's exaggerated, I'm just trying to show you because I might wanna do this one a little bit less than the first one, maybe half, okay? So now that's cool. So now let's go ahead and let's drag the, th the third one in, okay? Once again, C motion, we're gonna drag in R wing two, okay? and comes in as a step again, problem. So we're gonna take it off of step, okay? And we're going to give it another one, which is going to be pitch 
RX. Okay, we're going to click on that. We're going to give it 30 per 30. Okay. Now remember, when it's in the middle, it's at zero. So top, when you go to the top, it's plus 30. When you go to the bottom, it's negative 30. That's how this graph works. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to frame 15. Okay. We're going to drag this up positive 30. Okay. And we're going to drag this up down to negative 30. Okay, so it's going to go between, it's going to actually go a total of 60 degrees. Okay, so right now we have this kind of a, a flapping going on. Okay, now the thing is, is that we're going to talk a little bit about phase now because while I told you phase is really important for when it comes to, um, to uh, what you might call it, uh, um, flapping. I mean, steps, it also is used for other things too. So for example, what I want to do is let's say I want to have the second flapping to be delayed a little bit from the, first, third, from the first flapping for the first joint and the third joint to be a little bit delayed from the, let's actually up this to 300 frames from the third one. So the way to do that is that I'm going to take the second joint, which is this joint right here, and I'm going to take this phase and I'm going to say like negative 15%, let's say. So now you see what's happening is that it's trailing. It's flapping. It's trailing at 15% uh, from the first one. Now we'll go to the second one and we'll, we'll do it negative 30. If you do positive numbers, then it would lead the motion into it, okay? And then you can see that now you have like this kind of flappity type of thing. Now, this is all exaggerated, so I don't want it to be that much. So I'm going to go back to the pitch. I'm going to make it to 30 degree. I'm going to make it 15 degrees. Okay. And I'll make the third one like, for example, we'll make this, oops, on the pitch. We'll make it 10 degrees. Okay. So we have a little bit of flapping motion, but it's not like, we're not being nuts about it. Or maybe, we'll maybe, maybe, maybe make this 15 as well, so it's a little bit. Nah, I don't like that. I liked it at 10. Okay, and then as far as like the, then you could fool around with the phase if you want. Maybe we'll do it a little bit less obvious. Depends if you're doing something really cartoony or if you're doing something like realistic. It just depends how much you want to do it. But there's a little bit. It's a subtle thing. But uh, you can see that there it is. Now. Now that we've done the one side, you might think, okay, what do we have to do? We've got to go through and do that whole thing on with the other side. Okay. And the answer to that question is that no, you don't. Because what we can do is we can drag in the other side. I forgot if you can drag in three things at the same time. I'm not sure, but I don't think you can. So we're going to go to left wing zero. Well, maybe if I, if I were to lock this thing. And if I would drag these three things in at the same time, yeah, you can. So, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to, I usually was putting the zero first and then the second first in this order. So now, so I dragged the three things in, obviously all three of them have this steps on them. So we want none, none, and none. Okay. And you might ask yourself, oh, what, I've got to go through that whole thing again? And that's no, you don't, because you can go into the action. One of the actions is called reference. So I can give it a reference. I can give this one a reference and add it. There's the reference, and I can tell it what I want it to reference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference this one, wing zero. Okay? And... Uh, hold on a second. R wing zero. Oh, that's odd. Let me try this again. I'm going to drag in the C motion. I'm going to drag in L wing zero. Take off the step. Give it a reference. In the reference, I'm going to give it this one. There it goes. Okay, so now it's refer referencing the first one. Okay, now the nice thing is, is that if I change it, that I want to have like more of a flap, 
if I go to the pitch on R wing zero and maybe make this crazy like 60, right? Now they're they're doing it like nutty. Okay. But you notice that they're out of phase. Okay. Because if I go back to this one, the phase is at 20%. Okay. And then the phase of R wing zero is at zero. So I would need to go ahead to this one and make the phase back to zero. And now they're doing it at the same time. Okay. But so the nice thing about the reference is that if I edit one, the reference changes too. Okay. So we're going to quickly go ahead and we're going to, um, boy, the time really does fly here. Um, we might not get to everything today, unfortunately, but uh, whatever we don't get, we'll spill it into the next time. But so we're going to go ahead to the next one and we're going to go ahead and we'll take that off of step. Okay. And then we'll give it a reference. Okay. And we're going to reference this one to R wing one. Okay. And make sure that the phase is at zero, which it is. Okay. And then R wing two. Okay. We're going to go ahead, take it off of step. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll give it a uh, reference. Okay. And we're going to refer it to R wing two. Okay. So now we've got that whole thing going on and we can go ahead. Now, by the way, if I wanted to make this go slower, we could go type a 60 up there. Now it's happening over 60 frames. Okay. And now what we can do is, uh, but let's make it back to 30 frames. Although maybe this one, you'll see it better on your screen because this isn't exactly the fastest streaming thing. Can you see it? For, uh, what's the frame like, like frame rate like Ellie? Um, I don't think it's too bad. It's not okay. too bad for me. Even at when I was at 30 frames here? Okay. Anyway, so the thing is, is that, and if you want to go really fast, you can make it 15 frames. And now he's like flapping away like nuts. Okay. So the thing is, is that he or she, I'm not sure. So the thing is that now what I can do is I can go ahead to the, um, to the neck, right? neck let's just say the neck i can bring the neck in there okay and um where is it neck bring that as a target right also give that where did it go it went to the bottom you can move it up if you want if you want everything higher that's up to you now it brought it in as a step that's not cool because that actually makes him kind of look like he's like i don't know no bird flies like that although it's kind of funny to look at okay but we're going to take it off of steps. We're going to give it a pitch uh, RX. Okay. We'll give it like, for example, uh, similarly, um, we'll go to the um, uh, um, we'll add it. Okay. The phase is at zero. Okay. And, and that's fine. Now, in this case, what I want to do is I want to go sort of halfway through it to like 15 and I want to kill a keyframe here, but I don't want it to go all the way up. I just want to go a little bit higher because I really want them to go more on the bottom than on the top. Okay. Now nothing's happening is because I haven't set how much I want. So, so the thing is, is that let's say, let's go back to the beginning and let's choose how much we want him to look to, to go down. Let's say it's going to be that much. Okay. So now, but, but, but when he's going to be over here in, in, the, in the upper, we don't want him to go like looking way up. We just sort of want him to go a little bit more than zero, you know, a few degrees more than zero. So now if I were to hit play, you know, he kind of is doing sort of like this type of a thing. Okay. And then we're going to do a similar thing with the rear really quickly. Okay. We're going to take this. And uh, we're going to um, go to the uh, C motion. We're going to drag in the, the rear over here. Okay, there's the rear. What? Actually, we want it down here. Okay, now you might say, what is this stuff? Hub and target stuff? Whatever you apply to these are going to apply to all of these. It's like kind of like a master controller, like master pages. Okay, so this this is a hub, and these are targets. 
but this is a hub for all the hubs. And this is a target for all the targets. Think of it like that. So now where's the rear? Okay, here it is. Now, actually I started the rear as a new hub because look, it's, 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 it's out. I don't want it as a new hub. I want it as a target. Okay, so let me just delete it. Okay, let's bring in the rear as a new target right here. Okay, and take it off of steps. Okay, give it a pitch. Okay, and on this time, what we want to do is uh, we want to go ahead and uh, quickly go halfway, 15, frame 15, and uh, we're going to actually maybe make the tail go up a little bit, make these go down, okay, and then maybe, you know, if we go back to the beginning, we can decide that we want it to be like 5%. Or whatever, and then we'll do it with the tail another five percent. We'll make it maybe make this seven percent, and then we'll make the tail another seven percent. Put it down here. We could leave it down there. Add it, add the pitch, take it off steps, add this, you know, go halfway to here. Okay and do that make this another seven percent and so you're going to have something like this okay and if you want you can change the phase of the tail a little bit so it happens like maybe negative ten percent after the rear to give it a little bit of that so now you've got that going so we've got kind of like a flying gong of the um of the uh of the bird. Now you might ask yourself, well, what about if I want to animate some of these bones? Okay. And in this case, for example, in the case of the head, okay, that's the neck. Here's the head. In the case of the head, this isn't being controlled by C motion at all. So you can go ahead and you can have them, you know, look around as he's flying around, or you can have them, you know, look, look up or down. Maybe he's, you know, looking at something. So as a matter of fact, we can go ahead and we can, you know, like out of frame 20 we can keyframe that head you know we can go like maybe 30 frames later and he can sort of like look like well he maybe can you know turn his look down maybe he's looking at something on the ground maybe someplace he wants to land or she wants to build a nest okay and then maybe that'll hold out a little bit back to maybe here keyframe that and go a few more frames and then you know copy this keyframe here and boot drag it so that he's looking back up so you know play this a little bit forward and that's a little bit of a slow so you know they look down at that and then maybe he's going to look back up. So you can you can go ahead. Not all the if the bone's not affected by C motion, then you don't. Now if the bone is affected by C motion, it's not going to let you change it. Okay. But what you can do is you could do like a null. You know you could you can you can make bones parents, I mean children of other bones, and then move the null. So there are ways to do it. I don't want to get into this way that way here, but there is a way where you can you know, create more complex stuff. Now, the other nice thing about C-Motion is that, is that besides being able to like do this kind of stuff like that, you know, and you can have it, you know, um, wrote, uh, making cyclical motion like this bird here, is that you can go ahead and you can tell it, well, I don't really want it to go static. I want it to move in a line, okay? So you can actually have it move in a line, okay? And then, obviously, right now he's going really slow, so you can maybe make this 500, okay? And then, you know, now they're going a lot faster. Now it's going a lot faster, like that. And, you know, you can do things like change the direction. For example, if you wanted to, you can change the direction so he's flying this way or, you know, whatever, that way. Now he's flying away from us, okay? Um, you can also, for example, 
change the gradient so now they're kind of you know you could add some lift like 15 degrees of lift into it so now it's like kind of lifting up in the air but one thing that else that's really cool is that you can go ahead and you can look at you can go ahead and you can for example take the spline tool and uh you can um, draw a spline like this. Okay, something like that, whatever. And, uh, you know, you can make some of it go up, some of it go down, have them swooping down, have it whatever, but I'm not going to bother doing all that right now. I can, I can tell it to go on a path. Now I can take the spline and I can have it on the path, and then it will fly along the path. So now, obviously, that's slow. So you know, you can make you make it go 100. percent I mean, 1,000 like that. So, and there is actually we need to like up the 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 um, what you might call it, the uh, resolution of the spline sometimes when you, to make it a little bit more of a smoother uh, spline. But so then there's that. Now, here's the question. So right now we're on to, I want to leave a little time for, actually I had a whole other thing that I was going to talk about, which was we were going to rig the feet on this guy, okay? Because this is a really great, um exercise on the path to becoming a really good character animator um we were going to create like a walk cycle actually let me take off this landscape thing hold on and we were going to use c motion to create this kind of a thing, to have them walk. And we were gonna use IK and controllers, but we're almost out of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this for next week, okay? Um, where we can actually start getting into real character rigging. And then we're gonna start our um, character object discussion, okay? But this is also using C-Motion just like the bird did. And it also uses controllers in IK, so it's a little bit more advanced than the bird, but uh, it's it's uh, useful in that. So let's talk about some questions. If anybody has any questions, Ellie, you can let me know. Um, and, uh, yeah. and- Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, Absolutely. So go ahead and uh, and um, but you know what I'm gonna do before we do that. I'm just gonna take the C motion and get them to take it off of path, just so we can see it fly statically. Okay. So yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. So this C motion setup. Uh, who was it was wondering? Let me find the question. Ahmed was wondering. Can you save this as a preset and kind of reload it by using you, you know, like the preset system? You can save it as an action. So um, the thing is that I believe if you go to the basic tag, you could say save preset. Okay. And then you can make a whole bunch for your character. You can make him like a sneak walk, like a sneaky guy. You can make like a skippy guy, like a guy who's skipping. You can make like one where like someone is like, you know, jumping, you know, so you could save like a whole library of these things. And then whenever you need it, you just load it. You just load the preset and, uh, and, and you can, um, you know, go ahead and, and, uh, and do that. So yes, you can, you just, you just hit save preset and it saves it and you give it a name and you tell it where to save it. Cool. Yeah. That's great to know. 
Um, yeah. So, do you know, there's not actually any other questions, just some really nice comments. Jim was saying that time's Let's really see. flown by. Thought last week's session was the best of the year, but I was wrong that this week was. And Thanks, then Jim. From, from I really Bert, do appreciate that. Joe, just a lot oh, of um, yeah. a lot of lovely comments and amazing, and thank you very much. So, yeah. Oh, I so see them. Tab Thanks, Burn. So Tavo was just wondering, um, can the object be oh. scaled? So could the bird be the scaled? The object be scaled. Um, let's see. Let's see. Can the object be scaled? Well, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, when it, when it comes to rigs and things, scaling is a little bit of a problem. Okay. You have to... Um, you can scale. Okay. Like, for example, if we take the... Uh, let me stop this. If you take this, we scale that. See, if you scale the rig, say the joint scale, but not the thing, okay? To actually scale things, okay, is a little bit of a process once you have a rigged character. That's why you, generally when you build things when and you're rigging them, you kind of scale by coordinate scale okay um let's see let's put it in a no let's uh yeah that's right you could right if you go to this object and you go to scale this way yes you can scale it um and it scales the joint so yeah you can you can go ahead and scale it let's say you wanted to create that so you don't scale it with the scale tool you would scale it with the coordinate scale. Okay, now you can make like a weird thing like that. It's messing up the, con the parent constraints, obviously. But you can go ahead and... and uh, so in this case, for example, so there I've scaled it up twice as big. So uh, thank you for reminding me of that, Gene. Um, but the thing is, is that in this case, for example, with the eyes, if you want the eyes to scale along with it, everything, Okay, you can what you can do is you can just take the the uh, con these things right um, the uh, parent constraints right and let's say for example you take these two things and what we're going to do is we're going to create them as editable objects okay so you see that now they're not spheres anymore they're editable objects okay. And what we can do is we need to weight them to the uh, to the mesh, okay? Just like we did the other stuff. So how do you actually do that, okay? So the way that you do that is you have to do that same thing. You have to go ahead and you have to um, select those two things, right? You have to give them a weight tag, all right? And then you have to drag in the the uh, the joints to each tag. As a matter of fact, you don't have to drag in all the joints. You just have to drag in the head because we're only going to weight it to the head. Okay, see that? I only have to drag in the head. And now the thing is, is that then we have to create a skin object. Okay, so we create the skin object. There it is. And we're going to drag it under one eye and under the other eye. Okay, and then what you can do is then you would double click the uh, shift click the weight tag. Okay, and you see there's only one join in there. Okay, so I would s select these points, hit control A click on this thing, weight it to that, okay? Go to the other one, Control-A to select all the points, click on the head, and weight it to that. And uh, now it's the same thing, but we're not using parenting constraint. We're actually weighting the points of those things. However, it'll work exactly the same, or it will look exactly the same. But the nice thing about doing it this way, okay, is that 
if I wanted to, I could put a little bone in the eye, okay? And then this way, if I wanted to, I could, um, I could like rotate the eye, okay? Which I wasn't doing before. But for example, if I were to, you know, click on the eye and uh, click all of this and then hold down the control key, you know, and uncheck that and then make like a white color. Oops. Make like a white color and then First of all, I saved this selection, right? So I select store selection, right? So now what happened is I made a little storing of that polygon selection and I drag this material onto there and I drag this in there. Then what's happening is that now I have like a little eye on it, okay? And then what, what I can do is I can put a bone, you know, right in its center, you know, right in the center of this thing. And then I'd be able to I I'd be able to rotate him, you know, moving around. I mean, looking around. You know, if I wanted to have his his eye rot looking around. But but now that he now that the points are weighted, you know, and not the object is weighted, now what we can do is we can get um uh we can go ahead to the uh, object mode, and uh, and then and then we can go ahead and we can scale the whole thing. You know, now now there's now the eyes will scale with the with the uh, with the bird. Now, in general, I will say this is that when you're when you're um, rigging stuff, um, try to actually figure out like don't don't create a a, a human or a character that's like two inches tall unless he's supposed to be two inches tall you know try to make it six feet tall or five feet tall or whatever you, it depends on whatever it is uh it, it's better if you do that than if you not pay attention to scale be, and, and, and scale it why because later when you get into dynamics okay uh you want to basically the dynamics kind of work better uh at a um at real world um, dimensions, like gravity and stuff and mass and things like that. So, and then that's it. I mean, so does that uh, answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a few people saying, could you scale it by changing the model mode to animate mode? Yeah, but then you won't scale the bones at the same time. Well, to yeah. an, model mode to animate mode. Not really sure what you mean by that. So but, I think, you know, at the top where you go into um, model mode and object mode. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could go and you could scale the points. But the best way to do it, actually, is to just go and scale it in, in, in here. But not, you know, but not with this to scale tool because that's not that's going to scale the, the, just the joints yeah unless you were to like take all of this no it still doesn't still not really working as expected well it kind of is you do it like that but it's messing things up. I wouldn't do it that way. I would just do it by scaling it in the coordinates manager. But um, here's a question, stupid question. Is there a way to convert weight colors into a texture if you see what I mean? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think. You could maybe do something with the vertex weight manager. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. Um, one more question about moving on spline. Does this is by Ahmed? One more question about moving on spline. Does uh, does do can I manage time for it to go to end of spline? Okay, that's yeah. a good question. That's a good question. Um, 
Let's see. Well, I mean, obviously you can you can manage it by just upping the stride. Okay, so you can sort of go to the last, let's say you want it to happen in 180 frames. You know, you can just go ahead and hit the C motion thing and you can change the, the stride until you hit, you know, the number you want and then that happens. Um, but the thing that you could also do I mean, because really, you don't really even need this. Really, you could just keep it on static. And then on the um, on the null, you can just give it an, a, a, you know, like an align to spline tag. Align to spline tag, right? And then you drag in the spline here. And then you can also, mm, it doesn't seem to work. Okay, it doesn't like this. So you can't do that. Okay. So that's the way you would do it. You would just you would just go to the frame, however frames you want, and then you would you would change the the uh, the, uh, the the stride until you got it exactly to the position you want. So um, I guess you know. Let's see. Let me just see if there's anything else really quickly. Thanks for all your comments, everybody. I really appreciate that. I know we want to do like a, a wrap up with Ellie. And also, you know what? I don't like these things to be too long because then people see like such a big number and they don't want to spend that much time. Two hours, I think, is the limit before people says, oh, I've got to like put a whole afternoon aside to watch this. So why don't we just wrap it here? If you have more questions, maybe we can bring it up later. Um, yeah, I, to be fair, I think you've you've answered most yeah. of them anyway i think yeah, yeah we've been yeah. we've been going through quite quite well and you've been showing and answering yeah, yeah majority yeah. of a lot of people's questions which is great yeah. yeah and thank you everybody for the nice comments cool let me shall i steal the screen back and quickly talk about um, next week and then yeah we can head right. off right let me steal the screen back and then Here's my face, and then you can put your face, Ellie. So I'm back on. Let me just oh, yeah. grab there this. Um, why can I not see my own name? That's very strange. Show my screen. There we go. Can you see that? Uh, I can. And thanks, Hannah. Thank you so much. And thanks, Ahmed, and Jean, and everybody. Yeah, such lovely comments in here. But like, we really do appreciate it. And once again, Joe, thank you so much for this, the amazing stuff. Like you said, you think two hours is is too long. I, I say it's not enough. Like, that's what <laughs> yeah. a lot of people, no, lot of people with you. will I'm agree. With you. Yeah, I'm with you, actually. Yeah, it's great to really dive I'd into rather, such, such yeah. a big topic as well that is quite yeah. kind of advanced and right. and so many steps to take. Yes. It's really great to, to break it down over over two and a bit hours and really, really see how it, how it works. Yeah. Thank cool. you. So let me just grab this. Thanks, Jim. And, and really quickly, did you want to just sort of quickly talk about the kind of stuff that we're going to be looking yeah. at? In well, um, I think session. next week we'll start a little bit about using IK to do feet because, um, because, uh, you know, if you to, to try to do feet without IK and and the proper way of thinking about it is you'll you just forget about it. You just because if you take try to take the pelvis and pull it down, then the feet are going to go through the floor. You know, or if you try to lift a foot with you know, then then the pelvis is going to go in the air. So the thing is, is that you want to understand this feet IK uh, paradigm way of thinking. So. Um, so, so we might pick that up. Then the next thing, well, obviously, we're going to go straight into the character object. So, like as I said before in a previous uh, class, um, uh, feet. I mean, not feet. Feet is the last thing I was talking about. <laughs> the uh, you can eat when you whenever you set up a character, you have the choice to whether you want to build your own rig and from scratch. Or whether you want to use a template that where where which is really either somebody else's rig, 
or a rigger's rig or the character object, which is basically some professional rigger had put together a really nice rig that's built into Cinema 4D, which is very useful and I use it all the time. Now, if you're like creating like a weird creature that lives on a different planet that has like a propeller on his head and two little wings and, you know, three legs and one of them's a peg leg or something like that, then, then you need to make your own rig, okay? You can't really use a template, but nine times out of 10, if you're doing a biped, a kid, a woman, a man, you know, uh, an old man, an old woman, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you can use the character object. So we want to get into that. Now, the character object has a lot of things built into it, like, for example, the ability to have the uh, the uh, the the uh, character stand up on its the ball of its feet, like tiptoes, you know, or to rock the, you know, to be able to to tap his feet or rock his, his feet left and right, or and also other things, there's what's called an IK to FK switch, which is really useful uh, for a lot of things. And it's all built into this rig, and it's all really, um, uh, you know, would take someone days, weeks, months to build a rig from scratch like that. So that's what we want to really look at. And then once we're going to try to look at the character object, we're going to go over its different features and what it can do, and uh, and maybe talk about how to animate with it as well. And that's what we're really going to talk about next week. Cool. That sounds really great. Yeah. 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 And again, we'll we'll get those project files uploaded on kind of like the Monday or the Tuesday beforehand. So so they're ready to go and i think someone was asking earlier about the um bird project file that is already on the project files for the dropbox so um if you want to i think find the start that, one is i think that i think maybe they were looking at the one with the rig in there and i can put that on for you oh okay cool I yeah i can yeah. send you that later today i might yeah, take a cool, break yeah, after the class so either look later today or first thing in the morning it should be there yeah no that sounds great oh yeah cheers joe that'll be great i'll um upload yeah. that then when you when you send that over and then it'll be nice sure. to break down yeah yeah cool so once again thank you to everyone who's watched this live and thank you to anyone who's catching up on youtube and as always the biggest thank you goes to you joe for you. This, these sessions that the work that you put into them they're always as you can see in the comments they are such such a great couple of hours i and see that so, and i wanted to say, i want to say thanks to everybody for the wonderful comments I want to give a shout out to Kent, my good friend from New York, um, talented artist too. And um, and uh, I just, thanks for everybody. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Jason, Roger, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and taking part in this. Yeah, well, they, they come because of, yeah, all the all the great stuff that you're showing and the way that you Thank answer you. their questions, you kind of, you you actually physically break it down and and give an answer inside of c4d which is which is just really great great to see thanks so, it's a great so, yeah. program and i don't think that c motion has an equivalent really in anything else really i think it's really you like i said it's a little hard to get started with yeah. but once you hit it you know and once you understand what's going on all of a sudden it's going to save you so much time in the long run yeah, it definitely seems like an extremely powerful tool. Once, yeah. like you said, you get your head around it, then yeah. some great exactly. possibilities. Exactly. So once again, thanks to everyone. And thank you to you, Joe, as well. Um, I remember, hashtag how Max on we me and Joe love to see the sort of work that you put on Instagram and so so or, or Twitter or, or any of those those socials we like, we keep up with that throughout this workshop and any other stuff that you guys like to make in C4D. Um, it's really you know great for us to see how you guys are exploring with this workshop. And I hope, you have, I hope you have a great rest of your day, Joe, and everyone else have a great rest of your week and we'll catch you next Wednesday for part four. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye everyone.